Gung Tan, whose memories were fuzzy, learned from Yule about his origin story going back to ancient times. It was the time when Gung Tan and Van were first given their demon daggers from the monk to make them slay demons in their region. Although it was highly difficult to wield the blade as it was attacking their inner demons, both brothers endured the pain in order to be spared from the monk's tortures. Because of their success in wielding both demon daggers and gaining control over them, the monk was overjoyed by the results and immediately assigned the two half-demon brothers with the mission to eliminate all the lust demons in order to save the humans from the chaos that was erupting in the long-lost peace. Thus, both brothers' harsh training began so that they could master their demon daggers and become stronger than pure lust demons to ensure that they could slay them without any difficulties. On the other hand, one Miho's original incarnation, Wanjiang, the chosen one who was also being harshly trained by her predecessor to create a barrier that would conceal all lust demon, found out about the upcoming Demon Slayer brothers' gruesome training season and felt pity for them, seeing how much pain and suffering they were going through, wanting to make them feel appreciated. Wanjiang sneaked into their prison cell later at night and offered them a pouch filled with delicious food promising to come back to visit them again. Having this new person in their lives who was the only one that cared for them, both brothers continued undergoing their gruesome training, hoping to survive until nighttime just to see a glimpse of her again. As their interactions continued and their friendship grew, Wanjiang, naturally being the chosen one to save humanity, pleaded with the monk to spare the brothers since they were basically forced to become demon slayers without their will. However, the monk, who had no empathy towards the boys since they were half-demons too, didn't care and advised Wanjiang to also not care for them, claiming that the Demon Slayer brothers were already devoid of any human emotions. But Wanjiang, who knew very clearly that that was not the case, realized how cruel the monk was at that moment. So she made up her mind and freed both the demon brothers from their prison cells, leading them to escape from the cursed land through the forest. They stopped near a lake to take a break since they were still children who didn't have much stamina. Wanjiang was seen to be injured by Van, who had accidentally harmed her, but he made up for his mistake by apologizing to her. Gung Tan, in the meantime, became jealous seeing his brother Van become close to Wanjiang, even though both of them should have been equally close to each other. Not to mention that he seemed to only care for her injuries, even though he too was injured in his own arm causing him to become envious of Wanjiang. While the kids were enjoying their temporary freedom, the guards, who became aware of their escape, began pursuing them. The monk, who realized that Wanjiang had developed personal feelings, wondered what step he should take now that she had betrayed them, disregarding the greater cause. In the meantime, the two Demon Slayer brothers, along with Wanjiang, climbed to a mountain when Wanjiang suddenly fell to the ground as her body had given up because of the injury that Van caused her. Gung Tan, who realized that it was the perfect opportunity to get rid of her, told Van that it would be wise to leave her there and continue running away. But Van, who had grown fond of Wanjiang, didn't want to leave her side. So, he returned to the monk's temple to save her life, choosing to sacrifice his own. But the monk wasn't fond of the Demon Slayer brothers' actions at all, and made it clear to them that they were nothing but a bunch of tools whose only mission is to kill lust demons, telling them that if they did not do as the monk pleases, they would suffer in the lowest depths of hell. However, Van knew that hell would be less painful than their lives here. Yet he continued to train with the only hope of seeing a glimpse of Wanjiang in the far future. Wanjiang, in the meantime, also continued training, hoping that if she attains the power to create the barrier, the monk will no longer hurt Van and Gung Tan. Fifteen years went by, and as anticipated, both the half-demon brothers successfully became masters of the demon dragger and the complete version of the demon slayers. Van slashed through a lust demon skillfully who was attacking a human. But on the other hand, Gung Tan took the life of the same human mercilessly and repeatedly because he hated the sight of them. Van knew how much his brother hated humans, but because it was justified, he didn't stand against it and let him do as he pleased. Wanjiang, on the other hand, gained the power to create a barrier and hence requested the monk to free the half-demon brothers and let them live the rest of their lives like humans once she creates the barrier that will stop lust demons from appearing in their world. As Wanjiang agreed to comply with her request since she was the only one who could save them, Wanjiang visited Van and Gong Tan at their prison cell, giving them good news about their freedom. 
However, Gung Tan, who had never liked Wan Jiang, didn't trust her and told Van not to fall for her petty tricks, reminding him that all of the humans have treated them like monsters their whole lives. Gung Tan believed that after getting rid of the lust demons, the humans would also get rid of them since they would no longer be of any use. But Van chose to trust Wan Jiang, as he has done all his life, being certain that she wouldn't turn her back on them. Fast forward to the night of the full moon, when Wan Jiang was tasked with creating the barrier. The two brothers were freed from their prison, being tricked into believing that they were being granted freedom as promised by Wan Jiang and the monk. The monk claimed that a ritual would be performed on them to purify their bodies and souls and trick them into entering a locked vault, revealing that they would be burned to death since they were of no use to the monk, just as Gung Tan anticipated. The monk also claimed that Wan Jiang was also the one who agreed to this plan and deceived Van all along, making Gung Tan truly despise all humans. Van, who still couldn't believe that his beloved Wan Jiang would deceive him, begged the monk to bring him here so that he could hear it from her face to face. Wan Jiang, who reveals to have been completely unaware of the situation, continued performing the ritual to create the barrier, not knowing Van and Gung Tan were being burned down alive by the evil monk. However, the brothers didn't die as their inner demons took control over their bodies and helped them break out of their vault. Becoming totally out of control, the two half-demon brothers slayed all of the priests and apprentices there mercilessly and ended their fight in a total one-sided battle. Van, who was taken away in his thoughts for a moment because of Wan Jiang's betrayal, didn't realize that the monk was behind him and got himself stabbed in the back. However, he remained unharmed by the attack and watched as Gung Tan quite gladly took the time to kill the monk. In the meantime, Wan Jiang, who realized that something was wrong, stopped performing her ritual. She hesitates to continue, sensing that Van and Gong Tan are in trouble, but her master doesn't let her stop, telling her that if she doesn't create a barrier now, the whole place will be swarmed with lusty demons. At that moment, Van in his demon form appeared before Wan Jiang, asking for answers, which led Wan Jiang to hesitate even more, as if she had put up a barrier now, he too would be harmed by it. In any case, Van asked Wan Jiang if she truly deceived him and lied to him about their promise. But before she could answer him and clear up their misunderstanding, Gung Tan appeared there to take Wan Jiang down, being certain that she too had betrayed them. As she attacked to kill, Van attacked him back to protect, leading both brothers to fight against each other for the first time. Gung Tan's resolve to take revenge led him to win against Van, but he too couldn't stand tall against the pure and holy Wan Jiang. In the moment of chaos, Van jumped from behind to stop his brother Gung Tan, but he cunningly leaped behind Wan Jiang, leading her to get stabbed by Van's demon blade. As Wan Jiang died in Van's arms, Van promised to wait for her to come to him as another reincarnation for the rest of his immortal life. With her passing away, her inner divine power caused the entire area to be purified of all demons, including Gung Tan, who was completely taken over by pure evil. Wan Jiang's master, in the meantime, used the last of her own powers to seal the monk's souls in the three sculptures because she didn't want the story to end yet. Going back ten years to the present, when a man from the white-cloaked cult fell into a cave looking for ancient relics, he discovered Gung Tan in his eternal slumber. Not knowing that Gung Tan is a demon, the man came close to him and got his soul sucked out of his body, giving Gung Tan enough energy to rewake him. And that sums up the story that Yule was telling Gung Tan. At the main temple of the White Cloak's cult, Yule tells Gung Tan everything about the events that have occurred up until now. But he still doesn't let himself believe anything Yule says, as he still strongly believes that no human can be trusted. As he continues to move his body forward to attack Yule, Yule stops him from moving using his psychic powers, telling him that he is powerless against a sage. Yule states that Gung Tan is a chosen person who is trusted by the white cloaked sages and basically forces him to comply by slicing his hand off using Gung Tan's own demon dagger, which no mere human should be able to wield. As Gung Tan's left arm gets cut off, it releases demonic energy out of his body, causing him to scream in pain and ask why Yule wants his help. Yule clarifies his intentions and first reveals that he knows the monk from ancient times stating that the monk was a guy who had a pure spirit made him the perfect man for his plan. Of course, his plan was to take out all of mankind except the sages. 
Anyway, Yule reveals to be the one behind implanting the idea of making demon slayers inside the monk's head, whose only plan before was to train Wanjiang to make the barrier. Claiming to have orchestrated everything since the beginning, Yule reveals that he only led Wanjiang to make the demon slayers so that those demon slayers would eventually take the life of Wanjiang to ensure that she doesn't purify all the lust demons. But because of Van, Yule's plan has failed, and the lust demons have been purified. Not only that, Wanjiang is reincarnated once again as Miho. And that is exactly why Yule has rewakened Gung Tan from his eternal slumber as he wants to give him another chance for redemption to demonstrate how powerful he is. Yule releases a vial of cursed water into the ground beneath him, causing the ground to create a massive crack that lets many lust demons from the deepest depths of the earth come out. He then redirects those lust demons to be absorbed into Guang Tan's body and utilizes their cursed energy to regenerate Guang Tan's arms, making him realize that Yun is truly a sorceress sage. With Guang Tan back to business, Yule assigns him his mission to eliminate Wanjiang and all of humanity. But as to why Yule, a human, would want the world to be devoured by lust demons, Yule explains his reasons, saying that he is sick of the weaklings that humanity has become and only wants his group, the sages, to live in the new world. Yeah, that's some crazy Voldemort and Suguru Gido mentality, but whatever. Gung Tan, who also doesn't intend to play along with Yule's idiotic plan to make a perfect world for his cult, still agrees to join him as he really wishes to take revenge on the reincarnated bitch who was the reason behind him being locked underground for thousands of years. Yeah, he also wants to kill all the humans in the current era, because he still hates them. Now heading back to the present, Miho, who is tensed because of all the people being hurt around her, meets with Van, her personal bodyguard, on the balcony, seeking his attention. Van, who still seems to be mad over the fact that Miho tried saving Johan's demon brother, knowing that he cannot be cured, tells her not to act fearlessly just because a demon slayer is her protector. On the other hand, Butler Jang visits Johan at the office, who is still mourning for his lost brother. Jung advises Johan to move on and focus on what's more important, which is to protect Miho and awaken her powers. In the meantime, Miho and Van visit Beak Ju, as Miho wants her help to awaken her powers since she doesn't want to lose the people she cares for anymore. She straightforwardly tells the old lady to look for a quick way so that she can become Wanjiang again. However, Beak Ju explains that it won't be nearly possible because Wanjiang was someone who had spent her whole life training her mind and soul. So, asking for her powers for free is like asking for a cheat code in GTA, which is not how this world works. Still, Miho claims that she too can devote her life to training and endure pain. So, Beak Ju brings an ancient mirror that she had locked inside carefully and shows Miho her own reflection in the mirror, causing her to enter a realm and feel the pain and suffering that Wanjiang had felt in her lifetime. After training with her for a while, Miho goes back inside her car to leave when Beak Ju's grandchild Yom Jai comes there with her friend Su Ryon, who was saved by Miho once. Su Ryon hands Miho a present, in which she finds a hand-knitted red scarf. As Miho wears the scarf, she realizes that she does have many people in her life who she needs to protect, and that leads her to become even more determined to be reawakened. She heads back to her house on the way, wondering who she will become when she gets back her previous life's memories, Wanjiang or Miho. Although the immortal demon slayer has been with both personas, he fails to answer this question and tells her to just be herself. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Genius. Bro must be so fun at parties. But anyway, Miho's butler Jang requests that Miho come with him for a shooting session the next day, hoping that it will help reduce her stress and tension. His plan works as Miho successfully shoots many wine bottles and glasses with her gun. It also helps Miho realize that her present life's skills will still be there even after she attains Wanjiang's memories. So, she happily agrees to train under Beak Ju's guidance and begins to pack her stuff to go there immediately. Johan decides to join her on his journey too, making Van wonder who is going to become the third wheel now he himself. Johan, or worse, Miho? Not wanting to take Johan with them, Van even goes to threaten him but that too doesn't work on the Jolly Exorcist. So, with that being settled, Miho's butler Jang strictly instructs on what to do and what not to do, 
giving him the responsibility to be Miho's temporary butler during her training days. Later, at Beak Ju's place, Miho introduces Beak Ju to Johan before he can accidentally disrespect her and gets him acquainted with the grandmother, who recognizes him as the apprentice of an old friend, but the granny doesn't disclose anything about it now and takes Miho to a place first to get her properly dressed before letting her undergo her divine training. Once Miho wears the traditional ancient dress for her training, Van becomes stunned, seeing how identical she looks to Wonjiang. As he falls in love with her all over again, his body begins following Miho, but the old lady stops him, telling him that a half-demon like him cannot watch Miho's divine training. Although Johan gets the free pass to watch Miho train, Van doesn't stand by and also takes him away from there along with him. Shortly after, the old lady Beak Ju takes Miho under the legendary tree where Wonjiang used to train all her life during ancient times. Following Beak Ju's instructions, Miho begins absorbing all kinds of pure energies inside her body, mind, and soul, while Van and Johan continuously stare at each other, not being able to come up with a single word to talk about. Soon after, Beak Ju makes her return, telling both the guys that she has taught Miho everything she needs to be taught, giving Van the approval to watch her train. But she doesn't let Johan go this time, telling him to come with her instead because she doesn't want to be alone in her house. As Van goes to the training site to watch Miho, he finds her meditating on the ground beneath the tree, struggling to form the magical patterns she needs to make the barrier. But because she will learn the ways over time by practicing continuously, he doesn't intervene in her training and keeps watching over her. On the other hand, Beak Ju makes Johan cut wood for her making him question why he thought coming here deep into the mountains would be like a vacation. Beak Ju explains that she is only making him cut wood because Miho will soon need it when taking a hot bath after training every day, which will improve the blood and energy circulation in her body. Learning that cutting wood will help Miho, Johan becomes more determined than ever, telling the old hag that he is helping Miho awaken because he wants her to save the world from lustful demons. Beak Ju warns him that helping Miho will lead to him hurting people that a noble priest like him would never desire in their lives. This brings up an unanswered question inside Johan's mind as to whether he will be prepared to sacrifice anyone for the greater cause or not. Meanwhile, Miho continues to meditate but fails to generate a single energy particle, prompting Van to come in front of her, giving her a hand to help her get up. He also gives her his coat to make her feel better, knowing that baby, it's cold outside. While walking back to Beak Ju's house, many questions regarding Wonjong come to Miho's mind, but Van doesn't offer her any answers as it reminds him of his painful past. But when Miho insists, he tells her shortly about his story of being raised to become a monster, making her feel sorry for him. Thanks to Johan making a hot pot of water for Miho, she takes a nice long bath and joins the others for dinner where Van becomes slightly jealous seeing Miho and Johan bond together. Anyway, her training continues in the scorching sun, and her form also becomes better over time. So soon she becomes able to absorb the energy around her more skillfully. She continues her training while Van keeps watch over her and remains undeterred from mastering the technique. As days go by, Beak Ju's granddaughter comes back from her trip, not understanding why these unrelated adults have been staying at their place for so long. In any case, she makes all of them food when suddenly a menacing aura alarms all of them. As it appears, Gung Tan has made his move and is only on his way to hunt down Miho, who is still in the woods training all alone. A flashback shows when Gung Tan was awakened in the modern era and found it rather confusing how much society had changed around him. He saw a little girl down on the road and fainted immediately, being completely out of energy. The little girl carried him away from the middle of the road and helped him get shelter under a tree. When Gong Tan woke up, he saw the little girl laying asleep on his shoulders, and even though he realized that she helped him, his demonic instincts told him to take her life since she too was a human. But just as he was about to slit her throat, the girl woke up, prompting him to move his sword away. Moments later, the girl's drunk father dragged her away, calling her bad names and abusing her, and took her back to his house where he revealed that he had taken the life of her mother. Yet the drunk man didn't feel any remorse and started slapping his daughter for staring at him in rage. 
as he continued to assault her. The girl picked up the only weapon she could find for self-defense and got ready to stab her drunk, pathetic father. At that moment, Goon Tan came to her aid and stabbed her father for her, getting rid of the scumbag for her own betterment. Well, rehab was the humane option, but whatever. Anyway, after that incident, the little girl started following Goon Tan since she had no other family and started living with him, revealing her name to be Bayunji, the same girl who is currently known as Beak Ju's granddaughter. But how they got linked is still undisclosed for now. Another flashback shows young Wonjong coming back to her master after seeking answers from the monk about the half-demon brother's fate. Upon learning that their fates were sealed and they were bound to become demon sayers no matter how much pain and suffering that would cause them, Wonjong became upset as she didn't want this to continue any longer. But her master told her to look at the greater cause, which was to protect their land by creating the barrier that would seal all lust demons. Knowing so, Wonjong felt extremely sorry for them, so her master gave her a hug, sharing the burden with her for a moment. The hug caused Wonjong to break into tears and express how much pain she herself was going through because of her own hellish training. Still, she continued to do so for the betterment of humanity, and 15 long years later, she managed to become worthy of creating a barrier. Miho, who is now following her footsteps, senses an evil presence coming for her, so she instinctively releases an aura of positive energy to repel all evil energy, causing Gung Tao to run away in fear for his life. The sudden release of pure energy makes Gung Tao remember the time when he got sealed by Wanjiang, so he hides himself in the woods, not knowing what his next step is going to be. Johan passes him by, but before he can notice him, Gung Tao makes his escape. Meanwhile, Miho reveals that she has been completely consumed by the holy energy, which allows her to remember some of her past life memories regarding her time with Van. On the other hand, Van, who doesn't understand what's going on, assumes that Miho is possessed. So, he breaks past the barrier set around her and saves her just in time, giving both an opportunity to share a romantic moment with each other. On the other hand, Goon Tan comes across the statues of the Lust Demons and releases them by using his demonic blood on them. These demons immediately move around, sort of like Death Eaters, and reach the human town nearby, causing terror everywhere. Beak Ju realizes that Goong Tan, the evil spirit, is the one who has released these lusty demons. So, she requests that Van save the world from the devastation of his wicked brother. She also advises starting to stay away from Miho, as she will become Wonjong once she retains all of her memories, realizing that he can no longer give Miho his affection because that would lead her to hesitate to set the barrier since setting the barrier also means killing both demon brothers. Van decides to remain away from Miho from now on. Miho, who instantly realizes that something is wrong, follows him into the forest, only to get no answers from him. They head back to Miho's mansion now that Miho's training is complete. Johan, who also realizes that something is going on with the immortal introvert, gives the two some space to talk through it. Once he takes his leave, Miho asks him what's wrong and why he has stopped looking at her. But Van doesn't give her her rightfully deserved answer, and instead tells her that he will be leaving her side for the next couple of days. On the other side, Gung Tan, who knows Su Ryon is someone Yom Jai cherishes, accumulates some dark energy around him and summons a new demon, which he releases to possess Su Ryon. Once the demon takes control of poor Su Ryon's body, it prompts her to enter the empty school at night and take her own life. Yom Jai, who sees Su Ryon on the rooftop of the school, rushes to the school to save her life but fails to get there in time and watches her pass away. Just as Yom Jai begins mourning for her friend, whom she just lost, Goong Tan makes his appearance there, mockingly consoling her for losing her close friend. Yom Jai begs to know why, out of all the people, Goong Tan chose to take Su Ryon's life, and in reply, he says that he had no apparent reason, even though it is clear that he chose Su Ryon because both Yom Jai and Miho were close to her. Yom Jai starts hating Goong Tan even more than before, but knowing that he will keep taking the lives of all the people she cares for, she decides to do what he wants, which is to be by his side at all times. Miho, who sees the incident unfold in her sleep, wonders if it was just a nightmare or something, indicating that she has visions as well. The next morning, Miho goes to school with Johan, as she has a hunch that something's wrong, and as her worst nightmare comes true, she finds Su Ryon's lifeless body inside the bushes, rotting away. Not being able to take such an unfortunate incident, Miho decides to take a step when Van comes before her, offering her consolation and comfort. 
Miho expresses how furious she is and how this murder is ripping her apart, being angry at herself for letting Su Ryon die and not being able to protect her even though she had trained herself to do so. She falls into tears, questioning God why he is not letting her awaken her powers. Van, who also knows that the innocent little girl didn't deserve to die, remains silent as that is the best thing he has to offer Miho. He tells her to stop training and leave town, but Miho knows that if she quits her goal to awaken her powers, Van will leave her side, which she doesn't want at all. But what she has forgotten is that Van is a lust demon who is meant to die if Miho creates the barrier and achieves her goal. He makes her remember that and walks away, leaving her to again contemplate what she should do. In the meantime, many other school students who get possessed by the demons begin to step towards the school rooftop to take their lives in unison. Bayam Jai, who watches the scene unfold, walks away as she doesn't want to take responsibility for what will happen, acting like a total coward. Miho decides to go to the school again to investigate Su Ryon's murder since she knows it was not suicide. To prove to the media that it was a murder, they decide to take the school's surveillance tapes. However, Johan stops her, telling her that if she goes out there, Goong Tan's demon will attack her as well, telling her to stay inside the house as it is dangerous outside. However, Miho doesn't want to run away from her problems anymore because every time she does, people are sacrificed. Johan understands how he feels, but he still doesn't want to let her take the risk of losing her own life, so he follows her to school. But he is apparently too late, as it has been revealed that an evil lust demon has already possessed her body and has taken her to the rooftop of the school to lead her to her death. A flashback shows Goong Tan revealing to Byumji about the demon Gusensi, who is responsible for these serial suicides. He tells her that Gusensi is the type of demon who uncovers the dark side of people's minds and causes them to struggle so much that the victims end up taking their own lives. So, although Miho gets saved by Johan in the end, Gusensi breaks her mind completely with immense guilt for being responsible for so many innocent people's deaths, including all of the students at her school and also her secretaries being completely torn apart mentally. Miho loses her mind completely. Johan walks her down the stairs to take her back home when he suddenly hears screaming noises coming from one of the classrooms this late at night. As he rushes there, not knowing what's happening, he finds many students possessed by evil spirits responsible for causing the chaos. Being the expert noble exorcist, Johan begins exorcising the students, but because of how many there are, he takes another approach to save all of them and asks Jang to recite holy prayers using the school's loudspeakers. This plan succeeds as it leads all of the possessed students to escape from school. In the meantime, Johan begins looking for a way to exercise all of the students and runs into Van, who shows him exactly how to do it, giving him the school emergency hose pipe. So, Johan recites holy prayers to turn the entire water system into holy water and begins spraying the water all over the students, which works with Van's assistant, who helps by not letting the students escape. With their mission a success, the perpetrator, Goong Tao, on the other side, becomes disappointed. However, he remains a bit happy, as his most important goal in this scheme was to break Miho down mentally. He thanks Bayam Jai for that, revealing to her that Miho only broke this much because of Bayam Ji's friend Su Ryon's death, whom she seems to have cared a lot about. Bayam Ji, who also regrets her friend's death, doesn't show it to Goong Tao at all, as she knows it will only lead to Goong Tao attacking more of her close ones, maybe even her grandmother Beek Ju. So, she changes the topic entirely and asks Goong Tao why he isn't just attacking Miho directly instead of using lust demons to harm her, as that would be a much simpler method. Goong Tao scoffs, deciding not to tell the child that he is afraid of confronting Won Jiang's reincarnation. Instead, he tells Bayeongji to bring him an item named Haryubang, which he desires, threatening to kill her grandma Beek Ju if she doesn't comply. Sooner or later, Bayeongji returns home to her grandma, who has no clue that her granddaughter is involved with the evil spirit Goong Tao. Beek Ju shows concern for Bayam Jai and asks her why she keeps coming late every night, telling her not to stay away from her anymore. They recall their relationship going back to when Bayam Ji first came to her when she was 13 years old. It was during the winter that Beek Ju took Bayam Jai in because she wanted to help her find her own life upon sensing that something else was puppetering her movements. After giving Bayam Jai shelter at her home, Beek Ju shared many happy moments and good memories with her, but never realized that she was affiliated with the biggest demon of all, Goong Tao. 
Will Bam Jai keep acting like a coward, or will she confess everything to her grandmother? Find out in the next part of this series. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed the video, kindly like and subscribe to our channel so we can bring you the next episodes of this exciting K-drama series. Until next time, stay safe and take care.